Africa, where the human race began. Nearly a billion people live here. And it's a continent with an incredible diversity of communities and cultures. Yet we know less of its history than almost anywhere else on Earth. But that's beginning to change. In the last few decades, researchers and archaeologists have begun to uncover a range of histories as impressive and extraordinary as anywhere else on Earth. It's a history which has been neglected for years, and it's largely without written records. But it is preserved for us in the gold and statues, in the culture, art, and legends of the people. My name is Gus Casely Hayford. Over many years, I've studied the history and culture of Africa. As an art historian, I'm used to drawing stories from mute objects from the past. I'm going to discover the history and find out what really happened to the lost kingdoms of Africa. The army, which set off the present crisis with a mutiny that forced out the old prime minister. These are the moments when Ethiopia's kingdom came to an end. In February 1974, the Ethiopian military rose up in revolt. By September, they deposed the Emperor Haile Selassie. It was a coup that brought to an end one of the world's oldest continuous kingdoms. ...gave it its first written constitution. Realizing that times must change, he has decreed constitutional reforms be made, apparently with a view toward making Ethiopia a constitution... Haile Selassie was the last emperor of a dynasty that claimed it could trace its roots back thousands of years. The country is now a democratic republic, but Ethiopians haven't forgotten their kingdom's proud past. In the capital Addis Ababa, this statue of Emperor Menelik II celebrates Ethiopia's long tradition of independence. At a time when much of Africa was being colonized by European powers, Menelik II's army fought off an Italian attempt at conquest. Ever since that famous victory, Ethiopia has been a beacon of self-determination for black people around the world. But I'm here to get back beyond that, to the ancient history. I've got here the Kebra and the Gas, the glory of kings, the story that tells you of all of those kings, those ancient empires. And I want to get behind that and find out exactly what made this country. The book I'm carrying is a modern translation of the most important text in Ethiopian history. The Kebra and the Gas was written in the 13th century it sets out the lineage of Ethiopia's emperors. It makes some grand claims. It says the dynasty began in 950 BC and that the first emperor, Menelik I, was the son of illustrious parents, Solomon, king of Israel, and Queen Makeda, better known as the legendary queen of Sheba. The link to the Old Testament gave a legitimacy to the Ethiopian empire. But is there any truth in it? Is there really a connection between Solomon and Sheba and the Ethiopians? That's what I want to find out. I can't speak to an emperor, but I do have an audience with Ethiopia's most important spiritual leader, the head of the Ethiopian Orthodox Church. As with most ancient kingdoms, the Ethiopian emperors claim their power came from God. Church and state were inextricably linked. So evidence of the origins of the church might throw some light on the history and origins of the Ethiopian kingdom. Could you tell me something about the history or the origins of the Ethiopian church? 1,000 years before Christianity, Ethiopians have accepted officially the Old Testament order. 
and they have followed for one thousand years. So we accepted Judaism, and then we accepted Christianity. Now it is three thousand years old altogether. According to the patriarch, Ethiopia's Judeo-Christian tradition does date from the beginning of the Ethiopian kingdom. He says that the faith and the emperors came together. The foundation of this belief lies in the astonishing claim that the very basis of Judaism is actually here in Ethiopia. He tells me that the Ark of the Covenant containing the Ten Commandments was brought here from Jerusalem by Menelik, the son of Solomon. The Ark of the Covenant and the Solomonic descent comes together. The Ark of the Covenant is with us in Ethiopia. Can that really be true? If the Ark is in Ethiopia, it would be powerful evidence of a link between Ethiopia's founding emperor and the people of the Old Testament. But there's a problem. The Ark is deemed so holy a relic that no one is allowed to see it. And there's no historical evidence that Menelik I was the son of Solomon and Sheba. Yet faith in this legend is still strong. I want to find out why it endures and discover whether it's true. I'm going to look for continuities that might appear over centuries in religious traditions, in language, and in Ethiopia's old buildings. I want to see if I can connect them to Solomon and to Sheba. My journey would take me from Addis to some of the most important historical sites in Ethiopia, going further and further into the past to see if I can reach the time of the Old Testament. My guide here is Haptar Mumama. We've come to one of Ethiopia's most important cities, and it's something of a surprise to me. So this is um, the old city? Yeah, this is one of the five main gates of Harad. You know? Right. The legend of Ethiopia's unbroken Judeo-Christian history isn't that straightforward. Harar is a Muslim city. It's like a warren. And it confounds my expectations in other ways too. Ethiopia's modern history has been blighted by drought and famine. But in places unaffected by shortages like Harar's market, trade is brisk. Historically, the Ethiopian highlands are one of nature's storehouses. More crop species are found here than in any other part of the continent. Frankincense used in churches and temples for centuries grows wild here. Oh, that's gorgeous. What do I do with this incense? And it smells beautiful as it is, but how do I make it even more powerful? Yes. And then you put on the fire, and it smells good for the coffee ceremony. Mm. Thank you very much. Thank you. What should I be saying to her? I'm just. Secondado. I'm a secondado. I'm a secondado. <laughs> I apologise for being so English about it. For at least 2,000 years, Ethiopians have traded frankincense north to the eastern Mediterranean, along with a lively trade in other goods. Coffee was first cultivated here in the 9th century, but it isn't the most popular item for sale. This is chat, this, the, it's the, and it's the stuff that they, uh, they eat. And, and what, is it good for you? Is it, what does it do, the chat? Uh, it's very good that it makes you awake. It's just the stimulant. stimulant yeah. It makes you strong. It stimulates you more. It's to make me? Really? <laughs> 
As well as its secular uses, chat is used here by Muslim mystics to help them on their spiritual journey. But perhaps it's not a surprise that there should be such a strong Muslim population here. After all, it's only a short hop across the Red Sea to Yemen and Saudi Arabia. But what is remarkable is the role the Muslim population played in maintaining Ethiopia's independence, shoring up the relationship between Ethiopian Christianity and royal legitimacy. Back in the 17th century, Ethiopian Muslims made common cause with Ethiopian Christians in a deal brokered by Emperor Fasilades. I'm heading to his capital to find out more about him and the Ethiopian kingdom he ruled over. I'm traveling to Gonda across Lake Tana on the ancient trade route which avoids the mountains. The unlikely alliance of Christians and Muslims came about as a reaction against foreign interference. During the 16th century, the Portuguese arrived with two purposes in mind. One was to take over the Muslim trade routes. The other was to find a mythical Christian ruler called Prester John. They traveled right down the west coast of Africa in search of him. And then when the boat technology improved, they came up the east coast. And it was here, here in Ethiopia, that they thought that they'd found him. Prester John turned out to be a figment of European imagination. Instead, the Portuguese found a real Ethiopian Christian kingdom. And whilst they enjoyed some success in converting the local population to Catholicism, their attempts angered many. A foreign imported version of Christianity united Ethiopian Christian and Muslim alike under the banner of Emperor Fasiladis. They expelled the Portuguese and executed their Jesuit priests. Ethiopian traditions were again free from outside influence. Some seem unchanged to this day. Papyrus canoes like this one have been used here for thousands of years. Could you ask him if he's caught anything today? You are asking to the book. I know someone, someone. You ask one more. Yeah. So you can buy the fish? They can buy the fish. How much for them? Many were having him yet of an ashtar late. What kind of fish is this? Tilapia. Tilapia. Jillo. Just give him the money. What's that? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. To the north of Lake Tana lies Gonda, Ethiopia's 17th century capital. It's dominated by an impressive castle. The city was built by Emperor Fasiladas in 1635, the man who brought Christian and Muslim together in common cause. I've arranged to meet the curator here, Getsch Yigso. Hello, sir. Hello, Getsch. Yeah, you're welcome. Lovely to meet you. This is so spectacular. So what, what am I looking at here? So you'll see a real African castle. This is really the first place black people who live in a castle. In the palace in Ghana and in Morocco, in Tunisia, such castle. This is the first and only castle. The man who built it was determined to defend Ethiopia's independence. Getsch tells me that Emperor Fasiladas was a strong leader in control of a significant capital. Oh yeah, because in Ghana at that time there was about 60,000 inhabitants, you can imagine. That was 400 years ago, it's a big town. So, we're able to imagine that he was a Khan and very visionary man, very wise man. That's why he built such an edifice, an impressive castle. Fasiladis wasn't just displaying his power with this building. There are telling clues that he was also asserting his legitimacy by reminding people of the link to King Solomon and the people of the Old Testament.
up here I can see that, that there's a Star of David. Right, right, right. That is the Star of David because the previous Ethiopia kingdoms believed that their families comes from the Solomonic descendant. Yes. They are from the same family. Phasiladus was one of them. That's why he put inside. And connection to Solomon, what was that? I mean, is it, is it, a, is it a legend or is this an actual real? This is the real connection. I knew that it would be difficult to separate fact from myth. Here, it seems impossible. Of course, the Star of David is only one hint that the emperors claim to be descended from Solomon. I'm wondering whether there is anything else in this castle that points back to the world of the Old Testament. For me, the best way of getting a real sense of the building is to sit down, just spend a few quiet minutes just sketching. I suspect that Fasiladus may have been more influenced by outsiders than he would have cared to admit. The battlements look Portuguese to me, and the domes look east towards perhaps India. But I can also see what looks like a curious technique in the way the long wooden beams have been used in the stone building. I'm particularly interested in how the architect has used this beam to support the masonry. And it's a wooden beam. It's quite unusual for it to be that long. The beams are necessarily long for its function. My hunch is the design may be a throwback to an earlier time. It's almost like an architectural quote. To see it here in this site where they've absorbed influences from all over the neighboring regions is absolutely fascinating. Details like the beams suggest that while there were some outside influences on the kingdom, local heritage and traditions were fundamental. And the execution of the Portuguese Jesuits shows the emperor's determination to defend the distinctive role of the Ethiopian church. Just as in Western Europe, many of the oldest buildings still standing in Ethiopia are churches. And I feel sure these buildings can tell me about the relationship between the emperors, their faith, and their history. This church was built by Emperor Yasu, a close successor to Fasiladas in the 17th century. This astonishing painting is completely different to anything I've seen in European churches or in missionary churches elsewhere in Africa. I spend so much of my time trying to rationalize and explain beautiful things, but very occasionally I'm just completely knocked sideways by something. And coming in here to this particular church and seeing a lot of the Christian tradition that I was brought up with depicted in a completely new way with a level of intensity that I've never seen before, it's just absolutely astounding. The paintings have been completed on cloth, which has been glued to the mud plaster walls. Emperor Yasu seems to have been reassuring his subjects that he could look after them. He commissioned artists to paint angels on the ceilings, as if protecting the worshippers below. It's a stunning example of the individuality that the emperors were so determined to preserve. And I can't help wondering whether other telling traces of the past still survive within Ethiopia's ancient churches. It's Sunday morning, and I'm going to a service at a church far into the highlands of East Gondar. Bible passages are being read in Ge'ez, the ancient language of the Ethiopian kingdom. 
It's related to Arabic and also significantly to Hebrew, the language of the Old Testament and King Solomon himself. Habtamu says that no one speaks it now. For Ethiopians, it's like the Latin mass. But this isn't the main event. The crowds are outside a cave. And it's this cave that has the real significance here. This place contains beehives, which are regarded as holy by the congregation. That's how they make the tiny uh, from the ceiling of the cave. Uh, amazing. And that's why it's considered that it is a holy honey, because they are in the church. They died in the church. And nobody brought them by themselves. Oh, they came by themselves. And uh, the honey which is taken from this is given to the people that consider it as a holy honey. I see. Honey is a staple of Ethiopian religious and everyday life. From the honey, the Ethiopians make a kind of mead, which is called tej. It is both the national drink and the communion wine. This honey is believed to have healing powers, a cure for everything from minor ailments to major ones, like leprosy. Honey has long had a special place in other cultures in Africa and the Middle East. What's unique to Ethiopia is its connection to one of the kingdom's greatest rulers. It's said that a swarm of bees prophesied his future greatness when he was a baby, and that he was named after the bees' humming sound. His name was Lalibela. The city he built, which today bears his name, is a place which has no parallel with anywhere else on Earth. I've traveled east from Gondo. Now I'm heading to one of the most important places in Ethiopian history, Lalibela. This is one of the churches of Lalibela. They've been sculpted out of the mountain, each one carved from solid rock. You get a sense of just what a huge amount of energy it must have taken to excavate this hole and to do it with such incredible precision. Every single one of those angles is just so precise. You can still see the subtle incline of the hill on the roof, but the actual body of the church. And if you'd designed it, made it in concrete with moulds, you couldn't make it more precise. It's just astonishing. The man responsible for commanding the building of 11 of these incredible structures was Emperor Lalibela. But according to the Kebra Nagast, which was written more than a century after these churches were built, 
Lalabella was an interloper, a member of a rival dynasty which could not claim Solomonic descent. However, Lalabella claimed God commanded him to build these churches, and in so doing, he attempted to claim legitimacy as an emperor because he was doing God's work. A legend grew over centuries that the buildings were completed at superhuman speed. But recent research by a team of French archaeologists led by Francois Xavier Fauvel suggests otherwise. The usual story on La Libella says uh, that, uh, that uh, the, whole, uh, the whole churches were built at the same time, during, yes. during a very short period of time, um, whether it was three nights four th and three days or 24 years. Yes. But basically this is the same story. And, and now we are starting to, div to expand the sequence, yes. uh, and which covers now a number of centuries. Yes. And we, have, we have occupations here, human occupation, centuries before the, the 13th century. Yes. And, the, and the architectural program of La Libella develops on two or three centuries, yes. um, from the 12th to the, to, the to the 15th century at least. We can go inside here. There's still a great deal that historians don't know about La Libella. It's unlike any other archaeological site in that it's almost a case of archaeology in reverse. So in that way, it's very, it's, it is not an archaeological site. Um, and, it is, and, and you have to, 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 to wash your mind about all this kind of, uh, all this kind of previous um, uh, way of thinking about, uh, about architecture and archaeology. Instead of having successive deposits, you have, you have just successive removals of, um, of, uh, of, of stone. And instead of having... Uh, this deposit accumulating and giving you information about the successive uh, occupiers of the place. You have people who the more they removed, the more, the more they, they erased yes. traces of people that, came, that, that were here uh, before. The French investigations are expected to go on for at least four years. Emperor Lalabella left an intriguing legacy, one which underlines the uniqueness of his kingdom down here outside when you don't actually just have the light radiating straight down onto it that you can begin to see just the intensity of the colour of the rock and it almost glows. It just blows you away because it's completely unlike anything I've seen before and that isn't just in terms of the design but it's just thinking about what does it take to do something like this? It's a breathtaking display of the Emperor's power to be able to command his people to excavate thousands of tons of rock without any form of mechanization. And it speaks of the cosmopolitanism of this part of Africa at the time. They brought images, influences from all over Christendom and beyond. I look at the influences and I'm just amazed that there's a two-headed eagle that you might see in Constantinople. There's a Star of David and in the centre of the Star of David is a cross. And in the friezes above the arch, are what look like Greek icons. It's an astounding coming together of different cultural influences to create something which certainly aesthetically works, but also sends a signal about this being a new center of religious thinking, a new Jerusalem. This is a scale and quality of architecture on a par with many of the achievements of medieval Europe. And it's fascinating to see this cosmopolitan approach in a place which many medieval Europeans considered the extreme fringe of Christendom. Thousands of pilgrims made the journey here to worship, and 700 years later, they still do. 
People come here to the 11 churches of Lalabella from all over Ethiopia and beyond. Uh, it's, uh, we heard that it is totally different from other churches and religion wise uh, we are told that if a person go to Lalibela and see if you make a pilgrim uh, you will be uh, righteous and uh, from generation to generation so that's why we luckily uh, come here and to see the church there's no doubt that Emperor Lalabella left the kingdom something lasting and significant. It might also provide me with another clue that takes me further back into the past in my search for the kingdom's origins. The architectural features are very distinctive. These shapes are thought to represent the rising sun and the lower windows have a variety of cross designs. It's a double cross so that you can actually see it both as a cross and then also extruded. And then at the very top is this shape that you see everywhere. One of the things I'm beginning to think about this building is just looking at these windows, you are forced to ask the question, why? Why these shapes? But also why go to this length of bother to create something quite so complex? But more intriguing than the windows are the blocks at each corner. They look almost like beams, but the way these churches have been created means that they're architecturally unnecessary. This building is completely made from solid rock, so there will be no need to have any supporting structures inside it. And yet it has some of those sorts of supports running all the way along the length of this building. The use of apparently structural features as pure decoration tells me that they've been copied from buildings that already existed. Architectural quotations, if you like. It also suggests that those earlier buildings may have been important to the people who built Lalabella. Remember, according to the Kebra Nagast, Lalabella was not descended from Solomon. So perhaps in copying an architectural style, he was emphasizing his claim to be the heir of earlier rulers. Maybe in this architecture lies Lalibella's claim to royal legitimacy, to biblical descent, and to greatness. But I don't know how old the buildings that inspired Lalibella might be, or whether they lead to a connection between the kingdom and Solomon and Sheba. To find out, I'm going to head even further into Ethiopia's past. This is one of the oldest inhabited places in the world. Archaeologists have discovered signs of the earliest human development here from over four million years ago. Even things that appear recent are ancient. These terraces in Tigray province are believed to have been ploughed for 3,000 years. In pre-colonial times, Ethiopia was the only sub-Saharan country to use the ox-drawn plough, a crucial step away from the pastoralist culture of the rest of the continent further to the south. The terraces rise from the bottom of the valleys to the mountain peaks, and they all have to be ploughed in time for the rains in a few weeks' time. I want to try my hand at a 3,000-year-old skill. I'm a natural. I'm a natural. I nearly had my eye out there. How do I stop them? What do I do to them? <laughs> there is a serious point to all of this, and it's that this method of agriculture was unique to these highlands, and it doesn't appear to have spread quickly to surrounding areas. 
It underlines the isolation, separateness of life here. It's hard work. It must be about 90 degrees out here. I must admit, I really wouldn't want this as a job. He's just as bad at steering as I am. I might have to give him a few tips, I think. <laughs> We're 10,000 feet above sea level here. And visitors to towns like this are unusual. I wonder whether isolation like this is why Ethiopia's traditions seem to have lasted so long. They could develop independently and free from outside interference. But there are few places in the world more self-consciously cut off than my next destination. In the far north of Ethiopia lies Debra Damu, one of the most important sites in the country. Debra Damu is one of the oldest buildings in Ethiopia, and it sits on top of this imposing table mountain. It's a monastery dating back to the 6th century, and its famed isolation is justified. The only way to get to it is by climbing a rope made of goatskin up a steep cliff. And hopefully do a quick prayer for us as well. I need all the help I can get. Good luck, Haptamu. Thank you. It seems like a good idea to send Haptamu up first. He can show me how it's done. Oh. oh. No, he's fine. Well done, Haptamu. Okay, let's get this safety on. This has uh, worked for thousands of years. I mean, who am I to, uh, to doubt it? I mean, even if my stomach is uh, absolutely full of butterflies and doesn't seem completely convinced, I'm the sort of person who gets um, vertigo if I stand up too quickly. But, uh, but I really want to see Deborah Dharma, so I think all of this is really worth it. Probably wasn't very dignified, but I don't care. Just look at those views. We're right on the top of the world. Coming up here, getting up here, I wouldn't have missed this for the world. It's just amazing. When the monastery was first established, it's believed that up to a thousand monks lived up here. Today there are around 300. It's said to be one of the oldest permanently occupied Christian communities in the world, and it's at least 500 years older than Lalibela. It was built thanks to another Ethiopian emperor, Gabra Mascal. He ordered the construction of a colossal ramp to help get building materials up onto the plateau. Once the monastery was completed, the ramp was demolished and Deborah Damo was isolated once more. And the monks continue to take their separation seriously. So they don't allow women up here, is that, is that right? <laughs> no, women. no women at all. No women and that's ever. There were never any women allowed up here. And that's the church. In fact, 
Ever since the 6th century, they haven't even allowed female animals to be brought up from the valley floor. The fact that Deborah Damo has been so cut off for so long could be useful in my search for how this kingdom's traditions have echoed through the ages. I need to see the most important building here. Tomorrow I'm going to join the monks at a special service inside the 6th century church. So we're going to try and get a little bit of shut eye and then be up with the sun because that's when the monks get up. Like every religious ceremony I've seen in Ethiopia, their unique approach to Christianity is evident. But it isn't just the service that's catching my eye, it's the building it's being held in. Most amazing thing is to see some of the features that I saw earlier in my trip. But used structurally, you begin to get a sense of that history that was being evoked by the architects of Lalabella and Gonda. But here, it's actually holding up this structure. This was what they were echoing. Here are the square-ended beams I saw on the corners of the windows at Lalabella's rock churches. The rising sun window designs here too. And I last saw these distinctive long wooden beams in the castle at Gonda where the architecture struck me as being from an older local tradition. And here it is in a 6th century church made from small uneven stones. It's only these kind of beams that can hold up walls like these. And another feature literally stands out. Different shaped beams which extend beyond the walls. These are called monkey heads. I just tried to spend a few minutes just thinking about how this monkey head technology was actually put together. And what I think is that these heads represent the end of a sort of dumbbell-like piece of wood that sat across a beam. And basically, because the ends were wider than the body of these structures, it actually meant that the pressure from above helped to keep the building taut. This actually meant that you could actually build more than one story on these buildings. Here is a distinct continuity of architectural styles, which it's almost certain were developed indigenously over nearly 2,000 years. If this continuity stretches back even further, to pre-Christian times, perhaps there is evidence somewhere of the connection to King Solomon and to the Queen of Sheba. Deborah Damo deliberately cut itself off from the world. My next destination was once the busiest and most important city in Africa, Aksum. The interesting thing is, is that at the time that Deborah Damo was being founded, Aksum was a huge, thriving city. And I'm just reading this book, which is about Aksum at its height, about it being a huge ivory market and people coming from all about to trade with this enormous empire. The book is The Periplus of the Eritrean Sea, a first century travel guide which describes Aksum as a thriving, bustling city. In fact, other documents of the time ranked Aksum alongside Rome, Persia and China as one of the four great world powers. Given its significance, I think it's remarkable we know so little about its history. After all, Aksum has a considerable claim to fame. 
This, according to Ethiopians and their Orthodox Church, is where the son of the Queen of Sheba and King Solomon actually brought the Ark of the Covenant 3,000 years ago. Ethiopian Christians believe that beyond these walls is one of the foundations of the Judeo-Christian tradition, the Ark containing the Ten Commandments. Until 1974, that Ark was the cornerstone of the legitimacy of the kingdom itself. The existence of the Ark here would go a long way to prove that the Ethiopian dynasty of emperors was founded by King Solomon and the Queen of Sheba. It would confirm the legends that have lasted for centuries. But the Ark is deemed so holy that no one is allowed anywhere near it. I can't go beyond this point here because in that chapel there is where the Ark of the Covenant is said to be held. Security is tight and it must be kept that way to maintain the faith in the foundations of the Ethiopian Orthodox Church and by extension the legitimacy of centuries of kings. If the Ark is not inside this building, then the foundations of the church and the Ethiopian royal line would be destroyed. But the Ark is not the only potential evidence of this kingdom's ancient heritage. My search for Ethiopia's past continues right next to the Ark's purpose-built resting place. And now that building may be very new, but come and have a look over here. Down here is something very, very old. This is the remains of a building which is fourth century, said to have been built by King Azana. Azana, archaeologists believe, was responsible for Ethiopia's first Christian church. He was the first Ethiopian emperor to convert to Christianity. Archaeologists know this for certain because coins minted during his rule show almost the moment of Azana's conversion. One coin has a Christian cross in its design, but another, earlier coin, shows the pre-Christian religious symbol of the crescent moon and the sun. This is hugely significant. It means that there was a continuity of ruler before and after Ethiopia became a Christian country. The Judeo-Christian tradition here does seem to be unbroken. The coins confirm another fact. By the fourth century, this was a significant, well-established kingdom. This was the only place in sub-Saharan Africa at that time known to have issued currency. The coins aren't the only objects in Aksum that show the power this place had at the beginning of the Christian era. These are the grave markers, or stelae, of the emperors at Aksum. They were made from solid granite, and some date back to the first and second centuries. They are thought to be the largest pieces of stone ever to come out of a quarry in the ancient world. The tallest stood at over 30 meters and weighed around 500 tons. I think they're as impressive as any monument I've seen in Athens or Rome. My guide here, Yagalam Fisheha, is showing me their amazing carvings, which are still beautifully clear almost 2,000 years after they were made. They depict the great buildings it was believed the emperors would inhabit in the afterlife, skyscrapers to immortality. This architecture was the architecture of the Aksumite people. It's an architecture of a building. Yes. Multi-story house. I see. Multi-story house. Have you and then th these are the... Wooden beams. They represent, you know, the end of the wooden beams. When the Aksumites were practicing this architecture, for us, they started with wood. So we have the windows, so we have the wooden beams, then we have another. So this, in general, is multi-story house building. I've seen this before. This is the architecture used at Deborah Damo around 500 years later. And over a thousand years later, it appears to have inspired the stonework of the churches of Lalibela. 
At the top is a symbol of the rising sun once more. Just a very quiet epiphany moment when this journey has begun to really make sense. I mean, this stila, this single piece of rock, holds many of the elements that I've seen on my journey up until now, but here configured in a way that gives them a kind of sense, gives them a continuous historical narrative, which I suppose is the history of Ethiopia. The features on these stelae, marking the ancient burial places of Ethiopian emperors 2,000 years ago, have been consciously echoed down the years by the emperors that followed them. What I'm seeing at Aksum are continuous traditions taking the story of the Ethiopian kingdom back to the beginning of Christianity. But I still want to find evidence that the kingdom might go back even further, to the days of Solomon and Sheba. Yergalem has one more ancient artifact to show me. Wow, what's this? Here we have uh, a memorial stone inscription which was written in the beginning of the fourth century by King Ezana, wow. the first Christian king of Aksumite kingdom. So what, what, what's inscribed on it? The message of the inscription is more about his military victories and more about his political power. It's a proclamation, a kind of tourist information sign, telling visitors to Aksum about the might of the emperor. And it's multilingual, the inscriptions in the local Geir's language, still used in church traditions. It's in the international language of the day, ancient Greek, and it's in a language called Sabaean. Sabaean was spoken only for a brief time, and only in this part of Africa and southern Arabia. Historians think it died out around the 8th century, but it first appeared around 1000 BC. It's the language of Saba, the part of Yemen where the Queen of Sheba is said to have come from. This stone is from the 4th century AD, 1400 years after the Queen of Sheba is supposed to have reigned. It's not the Ark of the Covenant, but it does point me deeper into the past in my search for the kingdom's origins. It's thought that the kingdom of Aksum was a continuation of a civilization which had existed nearby. That's where I'm headed now. Just 20 miles away is the town of Yeha. It could be the Old Testament world I've been looking for. In this ancient town is a pre-Christian temple. There were worshippers here when the Old Testament prophets were writing. Over here, there would have been an altar and it's quite a deep well beneath the altar because there would have been ritual sacrifice here. This would have been a place in which the blood would have been allowed to drain. An important part of Old Testament Judaism was making offerings in the form of slaughtered sheep and goats. And this may well have been a baths where people would have come to cleanse themselves. I mean, this building suggests all sorts of things. Not much is known about the people who built this temple, but archaeologists believe this is the oldest surviving building in Ethiopia. And it predates everything that we've seen up until now. And the quality of this brickwork, it just belies the fact that this building is 500 BC. That means it's older than the Parthenon in Greece and centuries older than Rome's Colosseum. It echoes the Judaism of the Old Testament, the faith that the Ethiopian Orthodox Church claims was adopted here a thousand years before Christ. And it echoes what the Patriarch told me at the start of my journey. So we accepted Judaism. And then 
we accepted Christianity. Now it is 3,000 years old altogether. But the most exciting thing about this temple is a collection of artefacts found inside it. They're now kept nearby in this small Christian church. And I think they might offer a final clue about Solomon, the Queen of Sheba, and the ancient kingdom of Ethiopia. Praise good day. Thank you. I didn't know it would be like this. There are crosses and scriptures spanning many years of Christianity. Thank you. And there's an incense burner which doesn't belong in any church. It's been carved with the pre-Christian symbol of the crescent moon and the sun. Archaeologists think it dates from the 5th century BC. And from the same era as the burner are these stones, inscribed in the language of the Queen of Sheba, Sabean. These are almost certainly objects from the time of the Old Testament, and they show an ancient link between Ethiopia and Saba, the home of the Queen of Sheba. This takes us back to, well, to the very beginning. I mean, a lot of people talk about the Queen of Sheba, and here you're showing me a stone inscription which may well mean that all of that is true. It's pre-Christian evidence of the Queen of Sheba's language in the heart of ancient Ethiopia. It means it's just possible that the legend of her son founding Ethiopia's kingdom is based in fact. I wanted to find out whether there was any truth in the legend of Ethiopia's kingdom being founded by the son of King Solomon and the Queen of Sheba. In Ethiopia, separating legend from fact is difficult. The stones in the church, inscribed with the Sabaean characters, are estimated to be two and a half thousand years old. Not quite the three thousand years the church claims for its connection to the Old Testament, but not far off. And whilst there might not be proof of a blood connection to Solomon, there is a striking cultural connection to the world of the Old Testament. It's also striking that faith in this legend has lasted for centuries, closely tied to the unique traditions of the Ethiopian church. I think it's endured because of Ethiopia's determination to resist the influence of outsiders and to remain independent. Ethiopia's emperors may have died out, but the kingdom in many senses still survives, in the language, in the people, in the history, in the traditions. It's an extraordinary history, a proud history, one that deserves to be better known. The Lost Kingdoms of Africa continues next Tuesday at 9. And later this week, Professor Jim Al-Khalili goes back to the very beginnings of life and explains how chaos theory accounts for our very existence. The Secret Life of Chaos is here on BBC Four on Thursday at 9. <laughs>